And we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our YouTube viewers. Good afternoon as well to our Zoom participants. It's another e-learning session powered by Ariva Academy. And of course, welcome to another live webinar series for a cost entitled Pandemic and HR in 2020, How Strategic Should HR Become During the COVID-19 Crisis? My name is Irish Malonda. Together with our moderator, Mr. Howell Mabalot. Kamusta Hello. Sir Howell? Good afternoon. Today I'm celebrating my daughter's birthday. And my wow, happy birthday. birthday. She's in, they're both in the U.S. Yung sister ko at saka yung pag-anay ko. So how was your week as always, huh? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And of mm -hmm. course, you as well. How was your weekend, Sir Howell? Uh, masaya naman. Puro, puro messenger chat. And, and video calls. What about you? Um, of course, with my with my family, I got to spend it with my kids, my parents, my sisters. Yes. And belated happy birthday to my sister Maris Malonda oh, happy and birthday, my Maurice. son. Yes, my son JJ Samson. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, JJ. So let's start, Sir Howell. Sure, he sure. would like to please join me in welcoming our um, out of the country participants, and they are watching from New Delhi. India, Jakarta, Indonesia, Kota Kinabalu, Malaysia, Lalitpur, Nepal, Singapore, Bangkok, Thailand, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and Abu Dhabi. I would like also to acknowledge our viewers, YouTube viewers right now, Dr. Muhammad Salman Murtuza, hello sir, Casey Morales, Lisa Flores, of course, uh, Ceci Sioson, okay, Jocelyn Nistal, good afternoon, learn as 1PH, wow. Jocelyn Nistal, good afternoon from Dawis Bohol. He, she mm -hmm. is from Dawis Bohol. Okay, all good right. afternoon to everyone. Hope you're all well and good. Okay, let's start. In order for us to have a smooth flow of our e-learning session, here are the following house rules. For those of you who are first time viewers of our webinar, please type in hi in the chat box now. Let us know if this is your first time to watch our e-learning session, Arriva's e-learning session. Okay, Francis Bell, good day. Good afternoon. Maria Yunaiza Granados, good afternoon. Maylan Chin, Ant Sir Antonio Alvarado from Tagig. Hello, sir. Kamusta po? Mary Sel Pamintuan, Jessica Ventura, welcome. Maria Angelica Monina Zu Zuiga. Okay, sorry. Mar Margeline Kate Moncada. Okay, welcome to our e learning session. And let's do an audio check. You will be using the following codes. Please type in 111 to show if you can hear me loud and clear. And I am audible. 222 means you cannot hear me or no sound at all. 2121 means the sound is breaking up or there's a log and question mark if you don't understand anything. Geraldine Medina for the end time learner. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Arriva. Hi, Sir Howell and Mom Irish. Great day for learning thank you geraldine medina hello okay let, let's move on one 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 so far sir how well yes we're all good we will be having a two to three minute break after the presentation of our guest speaker and before we move on to our question and answer portion participants microphones will be temporarily disabled by the administrator during discussion to avoid interruptions Kindly put the viewing option into speaker's view for better appreciation of the webinar. Participants' cameras will be enabled at the Q&A portion, so get ready, guys. For questions and gratifications during the provided time after each topic, please click the raise hand button for the administrator to enable the microphone for live questions. We will entertain live questions from our Zoom participants. Questions will be entertained after each topic of the session. Type in your questions at the Q&A box. Again, at the Q&A box, not in the chat box. One question at a time will be entertained. For comments and feedback, please scan this QR code. This will be directed to our feedback form. Please send us your comments, suggestions, and topics to discuss in order for us to improve our future e-learning sessions. And now, to discuss pandemic and HR in 2020, how strategic should HR become during the COVID-19 crisis? Mr. Howell Mabala, please do the honors in introducing our guest speaker. Definitely. Thank you, Ms. Irish. Malonda Samson, sir. our beautiful president. 
Thank you. Our speaker for today is a consultant resource person on strategies and other management fields to certain central banks in Asia, premier Philippine universities, and top government institutions. He is a full-time central banker in the Philippines with a 12-year stint on strategic human capital management where he drafted a chapter oh, on institutional know. capacity building for the Central Bank's Book 4, chaired the Education and Now Communication Committees for the Association, and now serves as a research partner for the Southeast Asian Central Bank's Center. A certified talent economist, he teaches organizational behavior and people management at the La Salle Philippines and is a recognized national accreditor for local colleges and universities. He also served as consultant in 2008 to the Philippine Sports Institute. A year after graduating with honors from the University of the Philippines with a degree in communication under presidential scholarship and serving as an editor to its official student publication. Everyone, let's all hear it from and for Professor John Raymond Almeda. Let's put our hands together. <laughs> Professor John, hello. Hey, hi, hello. How are you? How well? Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. Hello, thank you very much. That was very energetic and very generous of your introduction, Howell. And thank you as well, Irish. You were so very energetic as well and very passionate. Thank you very much. How are you guys? We are doing well. How was your weekend, uh, Sir John? My week, my weekend was okay. I spent it with my family back in Cavite. And yeah, I was also trying to think about many, many uh, experiences that I've had so far and uh, the learnings that I've also had from various webinars that I also had so that I could also share it with the participants here. And yeah, uh, good afternoon to all our participants from the Philippines. And yeah, we've got international participants as well, right? So good morning yes. or good evening, whichever is applicable in your place. <laughs> We're already excited to hear from you, Professor. All right. Now, thank you, Havel. Thank you. All right. Should we get started? Yes. Let's let's get started now. All right. Sure. So let me get on my slides in here. There you go. Okay. I couldn't see myself. Yeah. This is the system here, right? So I'm just seeing right now the slides that I've got. If you can, uh, if you can share screen, sir, because as of this moment, what we're seeing is the the poster of our work, our webinar for today. Okay, right. In the meantime, okay, you started sharing, and we're seeing now the second of. There you go. So this is my first slide, right? Okay. Yeah, we good, Howell. We are. Yeah, all right, thank you. So once again, this is a great learning opportunity. And I just also wanted to thank Arriva Academy for this invitation and for saying yes to this particular opportunity for me to share. And for those of you who are just working from home or have those of you who already reported to work, this is some, something that, you know, like a level up or a step up coming from your, uh, the confines of your homes and the way that the way that you have actually expressed your initiative when the moment that you have registered for this webinar, it's already an indicator that you really want to learn and you want to do something that is beyond what is expected of you or that you value continuous learning. And this is very important nowadays because there is just so much impact that is going on, not just here in the Philippines, but all throughout the world, across the globe, and we could feel that. So for today, we will be discussing what is now the role of HR amidst the pandemic and how strategic should we become during the COVID-19 crisis? I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have already had uh, various webinars on, on HR and people management and how do we care for people, especially during the crisis, but it is okay because for this afternoon or for today, I'm so sorry for our international participants, I keep on saying afternoon. But for this particular topic, I'm gonna to be presenting to you three major or salient topics, which will be on the next slide. And the hat that I'll be wearing for today would be as an organizational behaviorist from the London School of Economics, 
not necessarily as a central banker alone or not necessarily as a professor alone in Dallas, but as an organizational behaviors. So let us go on now to our second slide. What will be expected from this particular presentation for this afternoon would be, how would you now know how to become strategic as an HR practitioner? By the way, I saw the profile that Riva sent me and I saw that the participants are either HR practitioners or, or leaders or supervisors and in different industries. And we really appreciate that because what we want here is that it is multidisciplinary, multifaceted. And HR, you can actually find that anywhere you go. And the HR DNA is not just solely uh, to the HR practitioners themselves, but to every supervisor, every manager, every leader. Now, these three expectations that you now see uh, on, on our PowerPoint are the very strategies as well for us to become strategic HR. Now, first, you have to know how the pandemic disrupted the core that is human capital. You have to have the data first before you move. So before any action or any decision that you will have to make, it is very important for you to know the data. What is going on around here? What is going on with the people that I have, to, the people under me or within yourselves? And as HR practitioners, this is in fact, our very opportunity, right? To, to step up and to be recognized, to be, to be noticed by people, how well we are doing with our role, because this is all about taking care of the people. Now, even if this is a grand expectation of us as HR practitioners, we ourselves are affected, right? I mean, we're not superhumans here. We're, we're human beings, we're ordinary human beings, but at the same time, we have taken on the role of becoming the carers of the people in our organizations. So we want to discuss at the very first or at the onset, how the disruption impacted every organization, not just our own organization, but all organizations across the globe. Now, the second one is rising to the dare of becoming strategic. A lot of HR, and we know this for a fact, even here in the Philippines and in, in most developing countries, a lot of HR departments or HR units still are on this traditional stage or traditional level. Something that is more transactional, something that is more on, I would just care about, you know, hiring people, administering uh, the test and uh, administering your payroll and giving you uh, the form all these forms that we come up with HR and let our employees fill out. We have all these things and pretty much these are very still transactional, operational and process based. But what does it take for all of us to become strategic? Because in most cases, organizations, especially when organizations are highly technical, most of them are trying to say that the core of this particular organization would be the researchers or the lawyers or the accountants or the economists. And the HR is kind of in the peripheries. They are not necessarily recognized as of equal footing. You know what I mean? And it's very important for us to be noticed. It's very important for us to be recognized as strategic partners and enablers and not just service providers. This is the very thing that we have to imbibe um, in the minds of our colleagues or our stakeholders or even our clients that we need to be strategic partners. We need to sit with them. We cannot just say yes to all the requests that are coming onto our desks. We cannot just tell them that we will provide whatever you request from us, but let us sit down together and let us discuss. Let us brainstorm and let us see where the problems really lie. We don't know, maybe it's, it's the leadership, maybe it's about the system, maybe it's about the structure, the capability or the culture. So the second part of this session is really about rising to that dare of becoming strategic. Even if we don't want to, even if we feel that we have been so discriminated or even if uh, some of our colleagues in, in the organization are not really believing that we could be strategic, then it's, this is about time for us to rise to that dare. Now the third portion of uh, this webinar would be, let us have or shed light on certain lines for heeding the call uh, for becoming resilient and agile. And these are operative words, right? I mean, most of our experiences in webinars and even in our workplaces, we have been hearing these words, becoming resilient, especially during natural calamities. Uh, it, well, we have a lot of that in here in the Philippines. And of course, agile. And the fact itself that 
we're not just talking about flexibility or adaptability, but we're talking about being agile and that has an element of speed. And we will delve on to that a little bit later. Now for our first topic, which is on how, to, how the pandemic disrupted the core that is human capital and giving data to our participants here. Well, you, you, for, for, for a lot of you here who have been reading the news and watching the news over Facebook or on any uh, platform, I'm pretty sure you have already gathered so much information, but I've just uh, summarized them for you. There's just some salient points that we could actually uh, find in various platforms. Now, we talk about the global workforce shatter. We did not expect this from happening, right? Nobody ever did. And, and there still have been reports that China has not really announced this at the earlier stage, but that is just an allegation. We could not really claim that one, but nobody ever saw this coming. Although some of the politicians, some of the leaders said that there might be a pandemic. And of course we had lots of pandemic and for decades and decades, we did not expect that we will be experiencing this again. And it's just so funny that 88% are now on work from home and we never did imagine this. Remember, remember during those times when our leaders and managers or supervisors are telling us that, hey, you could not do this work at home. You could just do this work here. And, and a lot of our supervisors and managers would have also uh, have this difficulty in trying to monitor our work. Probably also because some, a lot of, Asian people or Filipino people want interactions, want to see people, want face to face and want some human touch. You know what I mean? Not really the robotic or mechanistic type, but they just want to have an interaction, something that is more personal and that is okay. But the thing here is change is inevitable and change is the most constant thing here on earth. And we were all forced to not all, but yeah, most of the workforce and every organization has been forced to work from home. Before we were thinking that it was impossible, but right now it's happening. But what does this mean to all of us? Not everyone has a computer. Not everyone can adapt to, to a digital world. Not everyone can concentrate. Not everyone can juggle house chores, taking care of kids, for example, but at the same time working. And it's so hard. And some of the supervisors or managers would also be doubting on our loyalty to the work. That are we really home? Are we really doing our job at home? Or are we somewhere else? And as long as we are connected, as long as we can participate in meetings or in webinars, that should be fine. And everyone is just into the transition stage. And we want to be equipped. We want to be more capable. But the thing here is, we do not have any instrument to measure our readiness for a digital world. We do not have any instrument whether people can immediately work from home because of this uh, national and global pandemic or restrict travel restrictions and all that. And we can also see in the data, 97% of, of uh, travel has been halted. How are our expats right now, right? If you, if you take a look at the data right down below, it says 70% Dubai businesses to close in six months. And CNN has also reported a lot of expats are in Dubai. And the, the tagline, in, I think that was CNN or BBC, but it says there that it's now the end of the expat dream because you are no longer allowed to travel because you will now have to be in the confines of your respective homes and try to really work from home, monitor everything from home, try to uh, interact with your stakeholders and the, the rest of your networks from home. And it should be fine because we don't have any other choice. Otherwise we will get the, the virus and we will be spreading that to our families and to our loved ones. And also we have more than 50% of various establishments or firms have decided that they will no longer hire. And probably because a lot of, especially in Dubai, that most of these organizations are in hospitality or tourism industry, not all of them will have to survive. And this is why in six months, these businesses have actually announced that they will have to close. And what would that mean? This does not just mean an end to the profit or to the income of these organizations, but to millions of employees that are affected. And let us not go too far. Here, in fact, in the Philippines, we also have that. But what, I'm, what am I supposed to be flashing is, this is something that is already very familiar to all of us and something that is already cliche-ish because we have been hearing the term VUCA in almost 
in, in most of the forums that we have had in, in seminars and in trainings, right, even before lockdown, and, and this has been in the market even years back. And what do we mean by having a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world? This is something that is unexpected, something, a drastic change. But seemingly all of us have just been forced to this VUCA world. And people before were just saying that, you know, VUCA world is for the robotics. VUCA world is for highly innovative and creative organizations such as Google, Apple, etc. And we're so far from that. But no, here we are and everyone is just affected, even, even manufacturing industries even uh, drivers, even messengers, and even the, the, the uh, uh, all, all the callers, all the callers in, in the job hierarchies. And everyone's just affected and it's already happening. And let's not go too far because here in the Philippines, what do we have? More than 3,000 pretty close establishments. And even if we have the social amelioration program here in the Philippines, this is a monetary incentive or a monetary package or aid if uh, this is just for the benefit of those of you especially for our international participants and who are not aware about the SAP or the social amelioration package from the government. And a lot of people are saying that it might not be enough and the list would still have to be corrected or enhanced, especially in developing countries. And data is really the problem. More than 3,000 close establishments. What, what does that mean to all of us here? And probably all of us also have relatives. I mean, I am thankful that I'm working mainly for the central bank and I'm also teaching in De La Salle and I'm not uh, greatly affected by uh, the, the loss of a job. But what does that mean? It, it actually prods a lot of people to look for alternative jobs, to look for something digital. All of a sudden, people became what? Vloggers, became experts of e-commerce, invested in digital currencies. Everything was just going live online, electronic and digital. So... It, and it's necessary for us to have the technology. We have to be equipped, especially the educational sector. And I was, I was, you know, as a teacher, I was also worried about my students. Like, how are they going to be able to achieve uh, that optimum learning experience if they do not have a good internet connection? That is one. And what, what do you mean by a good internet connection? At least, what, 25 Mbps? which connects or which has a feeling of just five MBPS, which, which could already accommodate some of your webinars or some of your uh, Teams meetings. But the thing here is not everyone is capable of doing that. And it's, an, a, it's like a wake up call for people, uh, especially those who are you know, very luxurious in their lives that I should have saved more. And, and I, I've, I've read this uh, meme on, on Facebook that a lot of Filipinos are, really flamboyant in terms of uh, festivities, uh, ceremonies, uh, celebrations like wedding or baptism, etc. And yet when the pandemic struck them, they don't have any savings. It's just, it's just, it just speaks of, of some of them. Of course, there are a lot of Filipinos who also have savings and also have investments. But I'm, but I'm referring to those workers, especially the laborers, whose jobs have really been you know, forced to halt and and a lot of organizations like, and this is not, this is not something that is new, just isolated to the Philippines. We, we experienced that also in Disney, right? Disney has, has granted furlough to various employees. And what does that mean? It's like, okay, this is an official leave for you, but you do not get paid. It's like a no work, no pay mechanism here in the Philippines. And even here in the central bank, we also have that. But of course, initially we've come up with a certain, uh, uh, recovery mechanisms or responsive mechanisms for our outsourced personnel. And until now, we're still doing fundraisers for them. 2.8 million work from home workers. But are we all equipped? And I, I was saying that earlier, right? What does that mean when we experience these things? As an organizational behaviorist, it starts with an uncertainty moment, right? Well, you do not know when will it stop. I remember those times when we were trying to guess if the uh, enhanced community quarantine would be go to a halt, would be lifted, and would it have to go back to the general community quarantine? 
long, no longer any, any lockdown, lockdown and, and we experience that in various countries as well, right? All of these uncertainties. And for those who have, who were promised, for example, a more stable job, and here comes the pandemic and you no longer have a stable job, and suddenly you do not have a job anymore. It represents a contract breach. This is not a, this is not a formal contract that I'm talking about. It's something that is psychological. These psychological contract breach by definition is a breach in your perceived promises that are supposedly being met by your organization. For example, you perceive that Google is an organization of, of diversity, of inclusivity, of really good benefits, really good incentives packages. But here you go with the pandemic and you've got laid off, got retrenched. So it seems like there was a breach, although it's not written, but it's something that is psychological. So it, psychological contract refers to the perceived promises by the employee that are made by their employer. And whenever there is breach, it automatically results in job withdrawal, demotivation or demoralization. Now I'm presenting to you here a behavioral impact and one of which would be the contract breach. And we also have here some of the injustice experiences by employees, by workers. One is distributive injustice, distribution of outcomes or decisions. Who will we have to lay off? Who will have to receive greater salaries? Who will have to be put on furlough? These decisions were critical, right? And it's just a little bit sad when we read some of the news that some organizations tried to lay off almost 50% of the workers and yet their executives are receiving humongous bonuses. I mean, that's really sad. But although, of course, the news has to be balanced with getting the side also of, of the executives, and well, some of, uh, some of these organizations have also been in the defensive side saying that, oh, you know what, we've actually provided some separation incentive package to them and it's good enough for them to survive for three months and look for another job or look for something that's digital, something that is electronic. And that is given. And we, we, we appreciate that for some of these organizations, but for some organizations who are not doing so, we are just sorry for these people who have suffered from organizations who have left them out, left them behind. And I hope and I wish for those of you who are learning from home and are no longer connected with organizations, I'm so sorry for that experience and I hope you are doing well, keeping it safe and healthy still, regardless. And I hope you'll, you'll get the benefit soon and you'll, you'll get the, the blessing soon. There is another one here that I have highlighted, which is the procedural and interactional justice. Some people, I, I think I saw in, in one of the questions that were, were, uh, was forwarded to me by uh, Anne from Arriva, that some of uh, the information, for example, that, that you will have, or that you can, for example, avail of certain vacations right now, but it will have to be charged it will have to be charged against your uh, vacation leaves later on. But the thing here is it wasn't really communicated to them early on or at the onset, it wasn't fair. And this procedural and interactional injustice is the feeling of unfairness about the process. Like how did they come up with that certain decision? Was there due process? Was it deliberated on? Was my voice considered? Can it still be corrected? Or is it a consistent policy implemented in various units or for, or for all the people across the organization? Or is it about favoritism? Is it about all these dark side behaviors as we call it in organizational behavior? The other one is interactional injustice. It's a feeling of your supervisor did not really communicate with you smoothly, sincerely, and completely or comprehensively about the decision. It was an adverse decision for you and it really affected you adversely. However, it wasn't really communicated to you fairly or smoothly. And it also causes what? Demotivation and demoralization and something that is like an unmet expectation because you were expecting that you were, you, your manager would have uh, leveled up or would have, you know, have protected you uh, instead. This is what we call managerial distancing and organizational behavior. Managers would now be distancing from their role as managers as 
protecting the staff, but at the same time balancing it with the expectations from the management. So that is managerial distancing. If you are distancing from that role and you're just saying that, I'm so sorry, you will have to get laid off and that is the management's decision and I don't have anything to do with it because I made all these defenses for you and I could no longer do anything about that. That is like washing your hands, right? And that is what we call, well, to put that simply, and this is what we call in organizational behavior as managerial distancing. It's, it's kind of sad, right? If, if we have this particular practices in various organizations. The other one is organizational retaliatory behavior or getting back at the organization. You do not want that your organization will just be abruptly or hastily deciding that they have to lay you off. We, we no longer need you. I appreciate that. I think uh, Facebook and Google have decided that yeah, 50% could go on work from home and they did not lay off anybody. And that is a good practice because, you know, it is, it do not add up to the stress of people, right? We were, we're all anxious already about what's going on. Everyone is getting sick and there are just a lot of deaths, et cetera. And we just do not want to add up to the burden. Retaliating could be a result of a dark side behavior in the organization wherein when the organization does not clarify why you have to be laid off, for example, you will have to retaliate in the remaining days. And we see this behavior present in various organizations as well, or in a few organizations, that some employees, in order for them to get back at their organization, they would have to get back at their supervisor. It's like, I'm not going to be obeying your instructions. I'm not going to do the assignments or the projects that you have assigned me to do. I'm just slacking off here and I'm not meeting your expectations because when they try to breach that expectation from the manager, it's like breaching also the expectation from the entire management, in effect, getting back at the organization. And this is what we mean by organization retaliator behavior. Some people would even what? Commit arson, right? Light it up, your entire organization. If you do not want the management style or the leadership style of your organization, some people would have to leak some information to others. And all of these star side behaviors that are contained under retaliating against the organization is under ORB or organization retaliator behavior. I'm so sorry for sounding a little bit technical here, but I'm hoping that I am able to explain this more clearly for you in layman's term. I know that it's kind of a jargon, but this is just to give you a picture that it has been studied and the literature has it all to explain all these behaviors that we're experiencing here and abroad. And when people feel that their the psychological contract is breached or that there are injustices or that the mere fact that they are not included in the skeleton force but instead are working from home, but what does that mean when they are working from home and they are not ready to work from home? It leads to several symptoms of these mental health problems. And we see that in this slide, and we got this from Qualtrics, and they're saying that 53.8% are more emotionally exhausted, probably because they're trying to juggle it with the emotions that they also exert or are consumed by the emotions in their households. And they will have to juggle that with the emotions that they need to experience from the organization, right? And as you can see, there are also percentages for increased sadness in day-to-day -day life, more irritable and feel generally more confused. Some people are claiming that they have not been affected by the pandemic, but probably subconsciously. You will just observe that it will take toll already on your mental health, that you will become more irritable, that you could no longer uh, take in instructions that uh, stay in a stable manner or that you could no longer spend more uh, stable emotional time with your family because you've already been consumed when you're working from home, when you're receiving all these instructions from your supervisors or your bosses, and you become more generally uh, confused. And this is why, is if, if I may direct you to uh, the right portion, there is a huge difficulty in concentrating. 28.3% of people, and this is on top of your state, of your status quo. So if you are already having difficulty concentrating when you are 
in your workstations or in your respective workplaces, this is on top of it. It's an additional difficulty for you to concentrate. It takes usually longer to do tasks because you're not in the confines of your office. You, you're not facing your laptop. And what, what is happening? And, and some people who are not really privileged with a good office setup in their respective homes, what they have would be, you know, kitchen on the right or probably bedroom on the left and all these things. And, and it's just a different setup. And we know that for a fact. And studies also show that environment, your environment affects you a lot, your working environment. If you're not used to all of these, you know, naughty behaviors by your kids, for example, it would truly affect your, your work attitude as well and your, your work accomplishments. Some people are built for it, right? Especially for those who, are, who have already been working from home or doing e-commerce, for example. They're at this and they're really good at it. And maybe we could also get some coaching from these people, right? Because they've already experienced this even right before the lockdown. And pretty much they have thrived and they have experience this and probably they're already at the expert level. And you can see the rest of the data here on the Im impact on performance, difficulty thinking, reasoning, or deciding. This is why some people, even if we're trying to demand from our supervisors that, hey, maybe you can just decide right away, are we going back to work or not? And most probably you guys are experiencing this also from your supervisors, right? Are we going back to work or not? Are we going to be, get, are we getting tested or not? Are we getting the rapid or the, the swab test instead? So it's like, hey, let's not also get be, or be too hard on our leaders and our supervisors or managers. They are also experiencing the same anxiety and the same difficulty we are experiencing. And I hope we also become understanding of them because we're all human beings and they are not exempted from this. We are all experiencing this crisis. And it's just good to know that many organizations such as Starbucks has actually initiated creating and developing certain mental health benefits and even extending the, medic, uh, the mental health benefits to our, or to the, to the family members of the employees. Before it would be just, the mere health benefits. You get your basic checkup, you get your blood test, you get your chest x-ray, and you get your complete blood count. That would be that. And now it increased to having a mental health. And we're thankful that here in the Philippines, the, the mental health bill has already been approved. And certain organizations, such as the Central Bank of the Philippines, were coming up with a comprehensive mental health program to tackle these issues that people are experiencing, especially during the crisis. And these are inevitable, and these cannot be ignored. And we want to thank Starbucks. So if we have any participant here who is from Starbucks or who knows anyone from Starbucks, thank you very much for doing this for your employees and for your employees' eligible family members. This is a question that I'd like to throw to the participants. How well do you know your human resource? As a human resource, you have your entire human capital. All of the people in your organization are your human resources, right? But how well do you know them? Do you have any data that tells the, this is the percentage that got tested. This is the percentage that are still sick. This is the percentage who can really work from home very well. And this is the percentage who are immunocompromised. This is the percentage of those who are experiencing mental health concerns. This is the percentage of really doing it well, working from home or even doing even alternative or additional tasks. But do we have that data? And I think this is, uh, this is a very good question for all our uh, practitioners or our, our participants for today. And there is a, a chat box. Um, I think this is the Q&A portion and maybe Howard, maybe you can help me out on this one. Maybe we can encourage sure. some of our participants in, you know, trying it's to just a poll question, uh, Professor. It's not a, it's not a poll question, but it's just saying you either, just want yeah, either not well, okay. right? Yeah, either not well. You, you so, two hundred of our participants here well. in the Zoom room. I'd like to encourage you all to answer this question: How well do you know your human resource? And I'll be read answer you professor yeah if, if we have <laughs> if we have so don't be shy to our zoom participants please answer this question how well do you know your human resource correct maybe they just can say i know it too well or i do not know it and it is okay mm. or i do not know if i have to know it or i do not know if we have data 
and it is okay. Everyone is adjusting. So do we have any? Not yet, maybe they are into, in the zone of listening. Okay. Yeah, all right, sure. So maybe we could already proceed to the next slide. The okay, second... so we have Ara Abelania. I know them well, but on the process of improving them. All right, that is good enough. That is already a good start. Geraldine Thank Medina, you. data is available, including recommended actions from HR, even before the pandemic, but needs approval from management, budget advice. <laughs> so there is no approval yet from the management. It still has to be. Not yet. All right. Is, is that the second and last one so far? Yes, it's the second and last. Maybe if there be more, I'll read them uh, before we end the workshop. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Hal. Okay. Now we go now to our next topic, which is rising to the dare of becoming strategic and future. By the way, sir, Richard John Arceo said, we know them well. Oh, wow. Well, please share with us your strategy as well for knowing that. Maybe you could also conduct a webinar on it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Are we good? Um, Mariela Monreal says not so well. Oh, Mary okay. Selpa Mintuan says some people, uh, some simple data such as demographics, thanks to simple database. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially for those who do not have uh, any capability for having a more sophisticated system to access this data. Basic Excel would do, or even just bullet points coming <laughs> from HR would do already. And that data, and especially if I hope I'm conversing with the HR practitioners, especially for those of you who said that you have good database on this one, I hope you get to share that with your managers. And I hope you also get to recommend certain actions and decisions to the management, especially the ones that should be performed by the managers, because we cannot just be, uh, it's, not, it's not a mere role by HR, but a role, of course, by the managers themselves to cascade it down the line. So we see other questions coming in, or uh, we go That's now to the... All right, cool. All right, thank you, Howell. Okay, our second topic, which is rising to the dare of becoming strategic or future-ready HR. And a lot of people, when I, if, if I may share, if, uh, when I was in uh, Cagayan de Oro, that is, a, that is a certain location here in the, the Southern Philippines, I spoke to around 50 government agencies and they were, they were trying to benchmark with, uh, with the Central Bank of the Philippines as to becoming a strategic HR because it's just too difficult. You would hear stories from the participants, especially from the local government units, that their allowances when they have come to the training were not really enough and they have to stay like four of them will have to stay in one room. That is just appalling to know and quite a sad. And I'm fortunate that, of course, we're having the central bank as an organization, of course, would be so much concerned about the convenience and the productivity of employees with a good work environment. But it happens in most, especially in the public sector, that HR people are just seen as still just an added administrators, as personnel actions people, as the processors, as the compliance people, as the support group. They are not really seen as of equal footing with the experts of the organization, with the decision makers of the organization. And they are just the recipients of the decisions themselves. And they are just the implementers of this decision. They're not even part of the decision making body. And it's so sad that we're still having that kind of setup or dynamics in various organizations. We want to rise above that, and we want to rise to the dare of becoming strategic or future at EHR. Deloitte, which is a giant consulting agency, a research giant, has compiled various steps that are being taken on by various organizations, and they have this particular model of respond, recover, and thrive. This was automatic, of course, for HR people. Let's account. What, what do we mean by responding? We respond by ensuring that we segregate our people. Who will have to be skeleton force? Who will have to work from home? And then we ensure that all people would have a mass testing, right? Or undergo some mass testing, meaning most people, not necessarily everyone, but most, pe most people, especially the, especially the skeleton force, are getting tested. 
we ensure that they are mentally well. There is a survey that is going on, and this is one of uh, the respond mechanisms supposedly by HR. It's dealing with the present situation and managing continuity. And we now go to recover. It's like going back to work. So what do we do now? Everything has just changed, especially, for example, here in the central bank. The entrances, well, they are still the same, but not all the gates are open. The, the, the shortcuts, the bridgeways, only a few are open, not all. And I'm sure that this also applies in various organizations. And recovery would mean ensuring that we do not double it up. We do not double the infection up, or we do not double the risk of getting infected. Because we do not know, even if there is a rule that you cannot get in, if you do not have any negative result, there is no certainty for that one. After a few days, probably you've got buyers from somewhere else, and then you got into the organization, you got into the office, and then you've spread the virus, and we do not know that. Otherwise, we really have to have consistent testing, probably a more regular one. And we could also not do it on a weekly basis. I do not know any organization that is doing a weekly rapid test just to ensure that everyone is cleared of the virus. I do not know any organization on that. I've made some research myself, and I do not know any organization. Maybe in the hospitals, they do that. But in the corporate world, uh, no. But we now go to, uh, sorry. Uh, let me just move on the screen. And the recovering stage is in fact about learning and emerging stronger. We want to ensure that there is business continuity. Some people, especially those who are laid off, though some organizations have frozen hiring because they are now saying, hey, wait a minute. I think we need to strategize our workforce. I, need when, I, I think when we go get back to work, I think we now have become more aware of what are the jobs that really matter to the organization? What are the jobs that can just be outsourced? What are the jobs that are administrative or that are, are, are operations or process-based? What are the jobs that have to be uh, uh, digitized or automated? Or what are the jobs that need to have a double in size? Like IT, for example, and trying to digitalize everything or digitizing everything. Do we need more IT people? Do we, do we need more OD or organization development experts? And at the same time, it's a challenge for us, not just to have a look at the physical environment, but have a look at the technological environment. Are we equipped? Are all employees ready to adjust a transition into, because some, some employees are on rotation uh, basis. Some employees are reporting to work, but at the same time, when they are, they are also working from home in specific intervals. And we just have to ensure that when they get back to work, they are more confident and they feel that the environment is safe, that the organization is employing all these precautionary measures in order for the employees to just feel uh, that they are being protected, that the, the, the top management is really concerned about their health and safety. And the third one is thriving. It's preparing for and shaping the new normal, right? This has been the buzzword ever since the lockdown. What is now the new normal? Can we still thrive? Are we still relevant? Especially for, for example, payment system. We, we no longer encourage too much the physical exchange of the currency. We want that people, we want people to be uh, practicing e-payments digital transactions. So what does that mean for our tellers? What does that mean for uh, those that are delivering tons and tons of uh, currencies from uh, the central bank to the bank or vice versa? What does that mean to these workers that are greatly affected by the digitalization, right? And it's about thriving and it's about becoming still relevant. And when, the, when we flashed the data earlier, for example, 70%, 70% of the businesses in Dubai will have to close in, in a matter of six months because they feel that they will no longer be relevant. And I saw this news also that Airbnb, you know, Airbnb having, having stolen the, the scene of the hospitality from the hotel industry, they are still having a problem of how to become relevant as well. Right before it was really a booming industry but right now they are trying to reinvent themselves.
platforms. And yeah, good luck on Airbnb. They are listening, or if you know anyone from Airbnb listening. These are some of I'm just showing you some of the responses in the Philippines, and you could see this in CIPD UK as documented by the People Management Association of the Philippines. Of course, we saw an early release of the full month wages for the month of March, and we thank various organizations who have done this: online delivery instruction to professional subjects, full wages. Uh, of employment status, provided hygiene kit, uh, that's cute, provided work from home allowance that covers electricity and internet. Yes, of course, especially for those who need to have certain uh, Wi-Fi connections or who have to acquire uh, laptops or PCs just to ensure that there is business continuity or making sure that their targets are still met. There is additional medical assistance, of course. And we also mentioned earlier that Starbucks has done that too, well, provided 50 kilograms of rice and cash assistance. I'm not sure if this is also happening in Vietnam and in Indonesia, but in the Philippines, yes. Provided regular updates that are accurate and how it made an impact on the organization. And this is very important. We saw at some data from Qualtrics that 91.5% of employees across the globe would want communication at a weekly basis. Just imagine that. And if organizations will just be providing communication on a monthly basis, it will create a lot of uncertainty in the employees and therefore a lot of uh, depression maybe, or withdrawal from the job or demoralization, lack of trust and confidence in the management or some skepticism towards the management, whether the management is really keeping up to its promise of taking care of them or not. And, but the thing here is uh, we cannot just have a look at these practices because these are merely systems, right? And, or, or some of the leadership styles. But McKinsey here is offering us a framework that we can probably segregate or stratify our thinking process into these seven S. And what we are saying here is at the center of all these S's, the staff strategy, system structure, style, and skills would be the shared values. Are these the, the belief systems, or the ideologies, do you, together with your management or your supervisor or your manager, believe in taking care of people, believe that the well-being of people would be, have to be, to be put on top of your priorities? You have to share those values. But if, if there is no solidarity or unity in the organization, and there is so much silo mentality, like survival of the fittest, and not all organizations are really equipped, not all, all organizations are of, of equal treatment coming from the management, it's just unfortunate. And it's, it's sad to think about that. But 7S framework of McKinsey is telling us that in order for the entire organization to survive, we have to take a look at, of course, the shared values first, because it's at the core. Is this about, as Jack Ma would always have to put very, very well, this particular mantra, that it's not about profit, it's not about making money at this time, it's about surviving. And the fact itself that you are still living, you're still breathing, it is profit itself. It is an incentive or a reward itself to your particular organization. Do not think about earning too much. I'm kind of worried, for example, with uh, the, the, the PISO net and, and the Instapay, you know, all these interbank transactions because uh, we no longer, there, there's a, like a halt or a pause on, on the charge for, for the transactions that you make interbank using uh, PISO net. Sorry, what am I saying the track? PISO net. Yeah, but the, but the Instapay, I'm pretty sure about that. And yeah, so there is like a halt in terms of their income or, or profit, but it is okay, right? As long as you're, you're helping people, as long as you're making an impact on the lives of people right now, it should be fine. And some organizations like Cebu Pacific here in the Philippines, some of their executives, in fact, have caught on their uh, salaries, their executives, their executives. We also can see that, well, in the political side of, of the landscape, we see that in New Zealand when, when uh, the prime minister herself decided that she 
will have to, together with the other, uh, the, the cabinet members, will have to cut on their salaries just to share it with some of uh, you know, the government workers and other people affected. 7S framework by McKinsey is telling us that we, we need to recreate our values and we need to look into what we hold dear to our hearts, right? Do we, do we want to be together? Are we all in this together as the high school musical would say it? Or is it just about you know, the survival of the fittest? We need to take a look at the staff, right? Do we have enough manpower complement? Do we have the right size? Of, uh, of, of a task force or of workforce per se? Do we have the right skills? Can they access their computers? Can, are, are they okay with looking at their computer screens? How about for those, of, uh, those, those jobs that are mainly involving legwork or mainly involving menial work, not necessarily using a computer? How are we addressing that? And how do we reskill that aside from throwing them a lot of webinars and throwing them a lot of links to webinars. What if the people are not having much attention for, for example, this particular webinar of 1.5 hours? Not all people are very, very good at this, right? Some people will just want 20 minute lecture and the rest would be a Q and A. And some people wouldn't want even to take a look at the screens, but would want some coaching from their supervisors, right? This is now a strategy. And if you take a look, that is 1S in McKinsey's framework. What is now your strategy? Did you even have or collect some data about your staff's personalities? What if their personality is not about uh, email? They're not comfortable with your email, with your message on Viber. They're not comfortable with a, with a, with a, a, like a, a web communication. And this is why some people are not also comfortable uh, being seen, right? Especially in meetings, some people will just go on audio. They do not want to, you know, uh, dress up and try to project themselves on cameras. Not people are very, very good at that, or they're not built on that one. And some people can just survive with this particular setup. But we need to retrain people, and we need to have a look at the readiness of people to step up or to take on a different hat or to take on a different role in the organization in order for them to stay relevant. And the structures, we see that the structure can in fact become flatter, not necessarily too hierarchical because you know at one click, you can just send your message to everybody else, right? Well, of course in the office, we also see that when we do the emails, but working from home, it's like, you know, um, not, not not all people would be judging your nonverbals. Not all people would be looking at how you wear and how you, you carry yourselves or if, if you are wearing some uh, uh, corporate attire or some jewelries whatsoever, etc. And you are at the confines of your homes. And we see a lot of memes on, on Facebook about this, right? Like right now, you wouldn't even know if I'm still wearing pants. And for those of you who are wearing, working from home, you do not even know if... For example, I am, I am doing something on my feet, like am I trying to manipulate the rice cooker over here <laughs> or under, under here or what? So these are specific things that we want, to, we want to take a look into. And McKinsey is telling us to be circumspect and to be holistic and not just have a look at the health aspect of the pandemic, but the technology, but the staff, but the mental health, but the strategies and all the leadership style and what does it say? And what, sorry, what does it say specifically for our managers, for supervisors? We also need to have a look on revisiting our leadership styles or managerial styles. It's not supposed to be a one size fits all. And maybe before it was really working because you now can see your staff, but right now it's it's practically different, it's totally different. This is one of the practices in uh, uh, various organizations. And I got this from Forbes. And as you can see here, this is a survey that they conducted with a question, in what ways does your company offer training on how to successfully work from home? Because as, as we said earlier, 88% have gone on working from home. And we see here that many organizations are 
providing training to employees how to successfully work remotely and they still do that we provide training to managers how to manage a remote workforce these are just like a rephrasing of uh, the same question but we can see that many organizations are really doing their job and we appreciate that uh, a lot of them are doing it as as minimal as five percent so at least having something is already something tips for working remotely some organizations such as microsoft look at this they developed a guidebook for employees it's like you know when you're a new employee you're given this employee kit in order for you to to know the trainings that you need to do to know your onboarding procedures etc but here is a guidebook that was developed by Microsoft for its employees, for remote workers, how to focus on their well-being, how to use video, especially if they are not savvy digitally, setting up physical and virtual workspaces, and how to record their meetings and be inclusive in conducting remote meetings. But at the same time, it's not just about the workers themselves, but more on our managers, because the managers are the change agents themselves. They are the ones who need to ensure that the management's vision is still considered even by the staff that are the implementers of such vision. So we can see here some of the tips by Microsoft to uh, managers, like be transparent about workload and project status, like monitoring and not necessarily hoarding the information. Over communicate with your remote workers. It's not as if you're trying to, you know, uh, uh, what do you call this, drown them with the, the information, but letting them know that you care for them and, and they deserve more information, more awareness. Offering online training to remote workers, of course, and hopefully, especially those who do not have any access digitally and who are not equipped, I hope managers are also doing something about this. We do not even know uh, that some of uh, employees, for example, in a particular organization have various devices or various gadgets maybe you could lend them to your messengers your utility foreman who do not have any access to remote workforce or remote learning let alone creating virtual water cooler opportunities like working remotely can be isolating so look for ways to connect and this is in fact trying to veer away from the more personal connection right before you would be saying that, you know, uh, I do not want to communicate with people via email. I just want to have a look at them and do the coaching. Before the learning and development industry, which is looking at coaching and mentoring as something that is very personal and face to face. But with the pandemic, it has to be revisited and has to transition in also becoming digital. How will you ensure as a manager? that you are still coaching and mentoring your staff, even with the digital platforms, even remotely. Invest in tools, technologies, and equipment, as I mentioned earlier. If before, this is not one of your priorities, well, if we would want to get things still running, we need to prioritize this. But it's hard. It's, it's really easier said than done, right, to become a strategic HR. But rising to the dare, especially if you are still on the personnel stage, it's quite like a challenge for you. Like you're now just used to your comfort zone. We just, you know, taking care of the payroll benefits, policing people, meaning, you know, uh, taking a look at whether one is not complying with the, the, the rules or the mechanics of wearing a uniform or timing in and timing it out, or even filing of sick leaves, et cetera. If you are still on that stage, it's, it's what we call the personnel stage, according to this evolution of the HR function by the Salo Peck and Associates, Associates. And it evolved into becoming, let us now become HR experts. We want to see whether you are engaged, if you're happy, with a job. We want to know if you are performing, if you are meeting the targets. Now, so that we are clear with our expectations, we want to make certain policies and procedures. And we also want to hype up our recruitment because we have, we can forecast some data and therefore we can anticipate certain vacancies and therefore we also need to prioritize recruitment. But you know, this, is, this was just put in this particular stage. It is because before, it would just be primarily the top management who was very much concerned about 
uh, hiring. And we see that if we have participants from Pakistan and from uh, Middle East, we, there was a study, there is this particular study. Well, you can, you can, you can always check on scholar.google.com. There's a study in that uh, recruitment or talent acquisition strategy in Pakistan would be merely or would be more comfortably within the confines of nepotism because they trust too much their family members and they do not want to spend more time hiring people from outside. Mere recommendation from their cousins, for example, or from their uncles, from their relatives, from their family members would be enough. And they want to contain the trust and confidence within their own organization because it's so hard for them to have an, uh, to, to have an outsider uh, bringing in certain ideas. Of course, this is very, it's a stark contrast that we see in the Western part of the world wherein there is so much diversity and there is so much meritocracy that is being applied. And we, we thank, of course, uh, personally, I thank the, the management of the central bank for applying very consistently meritocracy or, or because we have our own merit selection plan basing really on the competence, the experience, the capability of people. Uh, but here is the call, right? What, 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 what call is this? The strategic, strategic HR. And, and before it was just, you know, what, what do you exactly mean by strategic HR? And people would just be overusing the term and it has now become a cliche, like, are you strategic or not? And it's simply because do you have a solution for it or not? And simply put, it's like bringing in some alternatives and that is already strategic. But what do we exactly mean by that? When we recognize that human resource is a human capital, what does that mean? When it is a capital, you invest in it, right? It means that it will grow. It means that when you provide training programs, when you provide training opportunities or learning and development interventions, when you coach people, you know that they will develop and you know that that will result in increased performance and therefore increase organizational performance as a whole. Especially if your organization is profit oriented, definitely you will really have, will really benefit from it a lot. Corporate culture. Now, a lot of organizations are still applying aptitude tests for its recruitment, for example, and even for promotional purposes. Do you have the knowledge? Do you have the skills? And that was just the very basis. But when we talk about corporate culture, it also talks about the fitness culturally of people, meaning can you relate to the values and to the norms of the organization? Are you culturally fit? Some people, for example, you uphold the organization upholds integrity, but you you do not you do not really care too much about taking care of the information. It's okay for you to share. Well, we thank the the, the Philippine government as an example for uh, having or uh, institutionalizing the Data Privacy Act. It's very important for us to protect the information, especially of of personal of, 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 of our employees. And corporate culture has to maintain, do we make sure that we're not losing track of maintaining the core values that we have set right at the onset? Are, are we ensuring that we are consistent? Some of the seasoned employees may not necessarily see values onboarding as necessary, but it is necessary. There should be some bridging programs or like a refresher course, especially for the seasoned employees, because values programs are not just for new hires. And these are also for uh, middle management. These are also for the seasoned ones. And let us, let us apply that to even during the pandemic, especially what well, we see this, right? As a, like a stereotyping of the baby boomers, like how are the baby boomers doing right now? They're not really necessarily digitally savvy. How could they access their computers? How will they be able to read all through my emails? How will they be, be able to access all these virus, all these uh, social media platforms, etc.? There would be some prejudices or biases from people about baby boomers, for example, but are they on board the culture? Strategic HR is also, of course, be becoming a str strategist. You have to ensure that you're anchored or your actions and decisions are anchored on the overall organizational vision. It's like, this is now the direction of your organization. It's, it's, a, it's really a, appreciated if the organization reflects that in its strategy map. If your strategy map reflects 
people management, reflects organizational capability, that talks about career and succession, that talks about talent acquisition, performance management, learning and development, and even rewards and recognition, that is truly amazing. And that is the ideal state. And well, personally, we are, I'm thankful that in the central bank, we have that articulated as well, even right now that we are strategically uh, supporting the strategic objectives of uh, the entire central bank value propositions. How do you propose to be known to the employees? What is the value that the employees can have or can build towards the organization? Even for hiring, do you now tell them that, you, hey, you need to join our organization because we take care of people who are learners in terms of uh, digitalization or re uh, remote work. Is, is that one of your value propositions if you are on the hiring stage or right now at the promoting stage? What is your value proposition to people? Do you tell people that we care for you? We just, uh, we just don't care about uh, or we do not care only about uh, the profit or the money that we will have to earn from this business model that we have, but our business model itself includes taking care of people. As a lot of consultants would say, a happy employee would mean a happy client, right? It ripples to, to outside, to clients, to stakeholders when you are happy. And, you know, as, as a cliche also, you cannot give what you do not have. If you are happy, then the people around you would also be happy. Competitive advantage, especially for, for those uh, of you who are in the competitive market as well. And total compensation. It's not just about monetary incentive. You know, a lot of studies are also showing us that monetary incentive would not really hype up performance. Good that you have that. It's not good if you do not have that. But adding more incentives does not necessarily mean increased performance. Of course, that is a generalization, but that is valid in most organizations according to studies, especially the theory of motivation. But of course, there are various motivated, major motivational factors from one employee or from one organizational to another, and you need concrete data on it too. Well, while here in the Philippines, if I may share with you, this, well, this is also uh, publicly uploaded. You can, you can find that too. And when you just type it up, it's a Civil Service Commission Memorandum Circular number 24, series 2016. It offers some of the stages of HR and especially the indicators of which, and I, if you can see, this is just, these are just the awards because these are like a, an encouraging mechanism for the CSC, for its agencies, in order for them to get accredited or in order for them to get recognized if they are process defined, which would mean level two, if they are processes or if their HR areas are integrated, which would mean level three, or if they are strategic enough, which would mean level four. And I am happy to share that the Central Bank of the Philippines or the Banco Central de Filipinas has been awarded by the Civil Service Commission as the only government agency who has reached level four. We were awarded uh, last September 11 by the this, uh, Civil Service Commission at the uh, NCR uh, level and uh, in November back in Palawan for the national level. And this is why we're also trying to share with the various agencies, we welcome requests for benchmarking. We want to share our experiences as well as HR practitioners in our organization. And because you know, it's sad to be alone in this uh, level, right? We, of course, we want a lot of organizations to be also on level four. But what do we want? What, what do you mean by being strategic? The CSC also has provided this description. Strategic human resource management means, sorry, by the way, prime HRM would mean program to uh, program to institutionalize meritocracy and excellence for human resource management. And level four of uh, CSE strategic HRM means that processes are focused on continually improving performance through both incremental and innovative improvements. And there are quality, quantitative process improvement objectives, which are regularly updated to reflect age changes in agency. For example, right now we have the pandemic. Should we change the strategy? And should we also change some of the HR processes? And especially for highly uh, hierarchical and highly process-based organizations that are TUV, 
uh, accredited. We highly follow manuals of operations, but right now that we have the pandemic, all of these have been disrupted, right? We are now in a very, very different approach to doing things. And it also, strategic HRM also tells us that HR also helps drive agency business decision on people, data, and insight. It means that you should have analytics capability. It means that you are making sense of the data that you have collected from your people and making sure that the decisions of the management are also anchored on the data that you have collected. And I appreciate that one of the participants earlier has actually mentioned that they have provided recommendations to the management as to some of the actions and decisions to be made that are people oriented. Keep doing that. We appreciate you guys. But right now, for this particular part, I'd like to ask you, we have already mentioned various indicators for different levels of HR. Where are you in the journey to becoming strategic? Are you strategic or are you still process oriented or just at the integrated stage or strategic, but not necessarily in all the areas of HR, but in only specific areas. By the way, what we got as an award, as a recognition from the civil service was a level four strategic for all the core HR areas of recruitment, selection, placement, performance management, learning and development and rewards and recognition. And I'd like to ask you guys, don't be shy as how okay. we were saying it before. Sige, don't sige. be shy to share. So to our participants, where are you in the journey to becoming strategic? So I hope that we can uh, well, elicit some answers from 100 plus participants we have here in the Zoom room and hopefully some from the YouTube viewers as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we hope to get but answers. If they, but them. if they're too shy to answer, maybe we can just read them during the Q&A. Right, right. It's fine. Yes. And it, it takes a lot of, well, you can actually take time to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Have a look at your processes. Have a look at your capabilities as HR people and as, a, as, a, as an organization. Have a look at your culture. Have a look at the, the, the systems that are in place. And while looking at these things, have a look at every. HR area, because most of uh, the HR uh, departments or units in, in many organizations are having uh, improvised uh, systems or processes in only specific areas. Like they are good in terms of recruitment selection, but in terms of performance management, maybe they still have a gap on it. And it is okay. It is okay to be coming strategic in just specific areas, not necessarily in all areas. I think with I'm from Cromwell, Maestrado, transitioning to building culture change and strategic performance management systems processes. Wow. Yeah, I, I hope that includes a lot of review of organizational values and norms, especially for performance management to include not just competencies, but also learning styles and personalities of people. These all should be incorporated when we chart the expectations that we have for our people, not just basing it on the job descriptions, but basing on them on their personal traits. Yes. Oliva Teleron is saying, I could say that we are still at the integrated stage and we are looking forward to become strategic. That is actually my ultimate HR journey. And you yeah. Know. All right. Good, and, and good luck on your journey. Being integrated is already a very good starting point. It's already a level three, meaning you're able to establish the linkages between and among various HR areas, and even the systems are integrated. So the presence itself, for example, an integrated HR information system would be a very good indicator of becoming an integrated HR. Do we have more coming in? Actually, we have one question. Okay at the Q&A box. We... Do you want me to read it now? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. In yeah. the cases of furlough, especially in the tourism industry, would it be fine to offer online engagement and development strategies, that is webinars, et cetera, even if they are technically on forced leave? As HR, I would like to do more than just giving out furloughs, uh, furlough letters. Recently, I am doing personal catch-ups with the team members but it's not backed up by management because they seem to be in, in your words, 
management distance. Right. Ma yeah, managerial distancing. Yeah. Thank you, Howell, and thank you for mm -hmm. for that question. For the anonymous attendee. Oh, okay, okay. She or he doesn't want to be recognized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's fine. Yeah. But for those who are experiencing follows, and then you are still giving them all these tasks. First of all, you need to be clear with the expectations. What for for you to know whether it is okay or not. Make sure that the recipients of that particular initiative would have a say on it. First of all, did you even ask them if it's okay for them to undertake these trainings, et cetera? Because that would create false expectations. In some organizations, they have completely shut down on any task. Even if it just includes training program, they have completely shut down on it because it might create false expectations. Like, what is this for? Will this result in some, because it, it's, it, it would mean what? Time. It would mean effort. It would mean a particular resource from the employee. So mm. if it, and the employee should be compensated as well for that, right? But furlough doesn't mention that they still have to be compensated because in the regular working hours, when you undergo training, training is still official. You still get compensated even if you're on training. But right here, you're on furlough and you're getting a training but not getting compensated. So there is some irony in that particular case. And you really have to be clear on that particular policy. You have to be clear with your, uh, with your management on it and make sure that there is buy-in from the employees. And is it really something that they also want or they are just irritated by it? Like, why do we even have to do it if we're not even getting compensated in the very first place? I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, we have an answer from Ara Beliana regarding the question a while back. We went back to getting the demographics in terms of personality preferences, learning styles, leadership styles, and integrating these data to our strategies and training plan. Right. Wow, that is comprehensive. I hope you also get to share that to many organizations that you know. Now, performance management at the core of it should have also some motivational assessment instrument because performance management is not just about whether or not you are addressing the gap of the ability of people. Later on, I will show you a formula on performance. So it, this question is very timely as well because motivation is, is, should be the focus of performance management, whether it is integrated or not. And knowing the motivational factors or the primary motivators of your employees should be the primary concern as well of, of the supervisors, especially, well, if, if we, we could see that in various organizations, like uh, reports from Deloitte uh, also show that coaching and, and mentoring is really at the core of performance management, regular feedback, and not just mere uh, compliance with, you know, I signed the contract, I signed this particular individual performance scorecard, and that should be okay. And this, that is part of also performance management, ensuring that there is really a conversation that is taking place. Uh, are we expecting more? That's uh, about it for now. Yeah. Okay, so let us proceed to the third topic. How do we now rise up to the dare of becoming strategic or future ready HR? Oh, sorry for that. No problem. Yeah, yeah. This is just a, before we go on to that one, this is just a, like a, what I, I said earlier that there should be at the center, there should be some buy-in from the top management for any, for any initiative that you are implementing or for any change that you would like to introduce into the organization. This is from uh, various references. I, I, I consolidated them for all of you guys, all the participants here, and we can see that also in programs from the London School of Economics, that at the center of any change initiative will be the champions. And usually CEOs, presidents, governors, the leaders of the companies are the champions, meaning they have to have the vision. They have to be the sources of the direction. They have to champion that one. What do we now do? And this is a pandemic. This is a crisis. And not everyone is really up for it. Not all leaders can be very decisive in this particular case. But the thing here is, a lot of people are just expecting that these leaders should be very decisive, even if this is a pandemic, and even if leaders themselves are the ones experiencing a crisis at the very first time. But championing a change should be right at your core as a leader. 
you should be able to encourage and inspire people to take on this change. It is okay to work from home, especially the ones that are not very comfortable with working from home. I myself, I am a leader. I want to also work from home because this is for the safety of my staff. This is for the safety of my colleagues. This is for the safety of my clients and my stakeholders. So if the action is coming from you and you're championing it, then that is the most ideal state. If it talks about like an HR program that for example, no to furlough, let us just reallocate the budget. Let us cut off on the other areas, but let's maintain the salaries and the benefits for employees. If you see that as an executive, if you are benefiting from it and you are concerned that most employees should also benefit from it, then you need to champion it. You need to support these HR programs. It's not easy. It's always easier said than done, right? And not all people would have that kind of initiative, especially if HR people are just in the receiving stage of instructions and do not have any guts, if I may call it that way, do not have any guts to present some business case to the management that we have to do this for the people it's difficult that it's just gonna be HR to be championing it. Because HR in this particular model would be the knowledge brokers. If you could see that, if you broke the knowledge, meaning you are the creator or the proponent of a certain policy or practice, you are a knowledge broker. HR people are usually the knowledge brokers. If people, if the employees need some awareness, information about the policy, Definitely they will call an HR, right? This is why HR people are called to be the knowledge brokers. The champions, as I said earlier, should be the leaders themselves, the top management. We also have the change agents and change agents is known as the most important thing here because change agents are the ambivalence, meaning you can take care of your staff. You can also relay that to the management. You have access to both valences. These are the managers, the middle managers who need to listen to the concerns of the employees and who need to communicate those concerns to the top management. We also have boundary spanners, those people who can actually span the boundaries to be very literal about it, but people who can break the silos in organizations are these people. People who are known to be, for example, this could be like a labor union or an association, for example, who can cross borders or people who have been rotated and who know a lot of networks from various organizations, they can span boundaries. And this is, this is a, like a traditional example, like some of the economists would have a different take of uh, losses, for example compared with accountants. Some civil engineers would have a different take of uh, the structures compared with that perspective from uh, architects. But if you are a boundary spanner, you do not care whether the ideologies or the practices or the ways of doing things are very different between and among departments, but you can span them because and, and you can sure that you can get them on board and you can make sure that uh, there you will be able to cultivate a common ground for them. Opinion leaders are people who are considered as like ambassadors uh, in the organization. Well, to, to put it bluntly in, in marketing strategies, these are the endorsers. These could be like a politician or the celebrity or whoever is influential that could make some impact on other people's actions and decisions following the champion's overall direction. Uh, Sir, uh, Sir John, if I may ask about opinion leaders, what yeah. if there are opposing views of highly opinionated leaders within the senior management team? How are we going to deal with that? Well, first of all, you have to take care of your own prejudices and your biases. We cannot just say that they are highly opinionated. Probably we could and just they say- are, And they are, I mean, on, they are trying to disprove other people's 
Okay. Yeah, and it, it has become a habit, right? Yes. So maybe, maybe it's because of their personality. So there are certain okay. personalities that are really like that, but you need to hear them out first. And what's important for you as a leader? As a leader, you have to take on the blue hat. If you recall Edward de Bono's six thinking hats, which has now yes. become seven think, thinking hats. Thinking, you, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the most calm hat. You have to moderate all the opinions. You need to hear them out. So if there is a stubborn, highly opinionated leader, we could actually categorize that as a red hat, especially if it's highly emotional and highly triggered into putting down other opinions or other people's opinion. But you need to listen and you need to put that on the table. And you need to also ask other people's perspective on that particular idea that was just laid down. And then you decide collegially. You need to have a decision consulting other people like, what do you think about this particular idea that was laid out on the table? So recognizing is the very first thing because a lot of personalities like this, as you were saying, highly mm. opinionated people need recognition. They need some highlights or spotlights. They need some opportunities to coach other people. They need some opportunities to be in authority. They need to have some platform to share and it is okay. And as a leader wearing a blue hat, you have to value diversity. And that is a prime practice right now in most successful organizations. Thank you for that. So that's not actually part of the Q&A um, <laughs> entries. Okay. That, that's the first thought I, that came into my mind when I saw Which this. is very uh, relevant. Thank you. Especially right now in the pandemic. Like, why are we expecting, uh, why are we expecting that leaders can decide deliberately? Not only, not only that, here in the Philippines, they have our netizens are highly opinionated as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, and especially in highly democratic institutions mm -hmm. wherein all opinions are being considered, they have to listen and listen and listen. And well, if you, if the, the flip side of it, when you try to consider all these things, it causes some delays, especially yes. when you need to really decide right at the onset, and you could not just do that because you need to consider other insights, other opinions. But the thing here is you, you need to analyze what are the situations wherein I need to consult other people's opinions and where, what are the situations where I just need to decide on my own and making sure that it's still gonna be beneficial or win-win uh, towards the end. Okay, so uh, do we have Wonderful. any concerns or questions? That's about it, we have the Two questions at the Q and A box, but we'll reserve that. We reserve that for later. All right. Okay. Thank you, Howell, for that. and thank you for those who are exerting effort in putting all these these questions. Now, the third topic is the lines for heating the call for a resilient and agile people management. I'm presenting to you a model here, and you've already seen some of the indicators, and we've also mentioned some of the indicators earlier about becoming a traditional HR, and when you transition into becoming integrated, then you can also categorize yourself as a progressive HR. Yes. But what do we exactly mean by becoming an agile HR? And Scott Madden, which is also a consulting agency, has laid that down for us. And they say that high levels of process automation, and we are already seeing that, right? Now, all of these manual jobs, and even for certain yeah. requirements, for example, uh, just merely, um, applications, right? All these documentary requirements for, for the, in the recruitment process, like uh, the certificates, the training certificates, or um, what, where are your certificates of employment, etc. Now, most organizations are all transitioning to becoming digitized or digitalized for it. By the way, just to, just to have a, a mini clarification, when we say we're trying to digitize, it just means we're trying to translate certain processes into becoming more automated. But when we are mentioning the digitalizing of things, we mean that it's not just about the capability of people. We also mean the culture of the people. We also touch on the systems and also touch on the structures. And we apply even the McKinsey's 7S framework for that. So the, it's the entire system of organizational development that we need to tap on in order for us to transition or transform into becoming a digital HR or an agile HR. Yeah. It also says here, deep HR data and analytics expertise and tools. So 
we have to have data and you do not have to procure a particular system for this if you do not have money for it. Just a mere Excel sheet would do. As long as you're clear with your data, as long as you know that you are accurate up to the detail, it is okay. You can run the data and make sense of the data that you have. Agility is not just about being flexible or being adaptable to the many changes in the situation. The changes could be about people, could be about the systems, could be about the weather, etc. But it tackles how quickly can you shift from one approach to another. So there is the element of speed, and this is clear when we talk about agility. And there is one indicator as well, which is flexible organizational structure to support problem solving and project work. And we see that during the pandemic, right? We see certain committees being formed, certain task forces being informed and no longer observing certain structures that this particular function would be just for this department, but no. So we see that as something that should be shared and something that should be integrated as well, because we want that decisions and action should also be fast because the pandemic is that alarming and it also entails fast decisions, but sound yes. decisions as well. Now, this is just a, a model from Blink Lane. Uh, it, it tells us about it, uh, some of the HR areas that can be considered as agile. It's on the right corner because on the left corner, we're still discussing traditional HR here. Sorry, I had some water. No problem. But well, experience that we all experience that. Yeah, I know. And it's our well, it's already four thirty-seven. We'll be having some time for the Q and A later. How many slides do we still have, Professor? Uh, I think we just have just a few more, and we'll be ending. Few more. Okay. Yeah. So that we can give some more time for the Q. Q &A right. Portion. So, so are you saying that we're already going over time for our uh, presentation? <laughs> but the thing here is, we've we're also supposed been to end entertaining. Yeah. Yes. yeah, exactly. But the thing here is, we've also been entertaining certain questions and comments yes, earlier, yes, and it's a very interactive as well uh, experience for all of us. Now, Agile HR also is telling us that, for example, for hiring, we do not just talk about the certain knowledge and skills, but we also talk about certain attitude and the cultural fitness of people, and we need to embrace the new talent contract. So we cannot just let people or, or, or shove into the throat of, of, of our new hires, of the, our, of the applicants, so certain job descriptions, but also considering whether they are really up for it, whether their dispositions are also aligned with the values of the organization. Supporting impactful learning and growth is also here on this quadrant offered by yes. Link Lane. And moving to an iterative performance flow, we've already mentioned that earlier, and taking the issue of money off the table, as I also mentioned that mm -hmm. when Jack Ma influenced some of his colleagues, businessmen in, in the industry, telling them that, hey, uh, let go of all these profits, and let go of the money talks right now, but let us just take care of the people concern us as, lo as long as we live and we exist and that it's profit itself. And I mentioned this slide, particular slide earlier about the focus of performance management, which is motivation, because it's the multiplier of ability. And when we talk about getting motivated, we are talking about whether people are engaged, meaning they know what they're doing. This is why they are masters of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We also talk about empowering people, trusting them that they could deliver, trusting them that they could meet the targets and they are in control of their resources and they can be flexible as much as they want. They can also take on their own strategy. And that experience is what we call autonomy. And Daniel Pink is an author of Drive book, which also talks about autonomy. And the other one is in fact commitment. Being committed, being motivated is also a feeling of being committed and it is a result of feeling relevant. Are people listening to you? Is your voice recognized? Or is it just be, gonna be the, the decision makers that are being considered? Is it just the managers or the leaders themselves that are being considered? And you, you are just the implementer. So uh, this particular model is telling us that if you find yourself being valued, then you will feel more commitment and probably you will also uh, decide to stay longer in the organization. And even Peter Drucker himself, who is a known management consultant, also recognizes this, the mastery, autonomy, and purpose mm -hmm. as the primary motivators of our 21st century workforce so that they will feel engaged, empowered, and committed. Mm -hmm. 
This is just a reflective question for you. Like, do you have what it takes to be an agile HR in the digital era? We've already presented okay. you some of the indicators. Thank you, sir. For those who are still here in the Zoom room, please answer the question. Do you have what it takes? Or at least do you think or do you believe you have what it takes to be an agile HR in the digital era? They could answer that to themselves. That could also be oh, like a okay. take home because by the, the indicators way, need to yes, be recognized sir. by both the manager, not just them, but the entire team. And I think okay. we're already receiving responses. We're on it, say, says Cromwell Maestrado. You, they're on it. They're on it. Wow. I really by appreciate way, that. This is by the way, Ms. Irish. Sharing by Cromwell. Okay. Yes. He's one of the most active participants of our Zoom room since April. Maybe Sir we Cromwell could have Maestrado. maybe we could have like a Hall of Fame award for most active participants. That is a great idea, in fact. <laughs> Do we have more coming in? Uh, Geraldine Medina, thank you, Prof. Oh well, thank you, and thank you for being here, and you're welcome. And please get in touch. And we already have three questions at the Q and A box. We'll read them one by one later. That's right. And we're, I think in, in a few minutes, we're already on that, probably in a few seconds. So I just wanted to say that we've tackled so far these things. How to become strategic HR? Well, you need to know the data. You need to know how the pandemic in the very first place has disrupted the core, that is the human capital. You need to rise to the dare of becoming strategic and future ready. You need to know the systems, the structures, the capability, and the culture that you have in place. And if you've got the indicators, and you need to develop your indicators so that you know also how to assess the level of your HR processes and systems, or even the values in HR in your organization, and you need to know, become well aware of the lines for hitting the call for a resilient and agile people management. So yeah, so if we have the three questions, how will so thank you so much, Professor John Raymond Almeida. Everybody, big hand for <laughs> Professor John Raymond. You are so we'll be we'll just be taking two minute a two minute break, Sir John, if it's okay right. with you, so you can replenish cool. your body fluids. And we thank yeah. you for your general sharing of ideas and information. Well researched material has been presented for the past one hour and forty minutes. We appreciate it a lot. And so when we come back. For our participants, start typing your questions, not at the chat box, but at the Q&A box right now. Don't you go away. We will be right back.